Hi, everyone. Welcome to the GSAP Open House for the Masters of Science in Computational Design Practices. Um, if you feel comfortable, um, why don't you turn your images on just so I can just say hi to everybody before I start sharing the screen and we disappear into the tiny little boxes on the side. Okay, so um, I'm going to share my screen and begin the presentation. First, let me introduce you to two uh, critical people over here, Adam Vosberg. Some of you might have already um, communicated with him. He's assistant director of the CDP program and has a lot of interaction with students as they're applying. Um, you know, also the admissions office, obviously, but you'll find that you're talking to Adam a lot. Um, and also want to introduce you to Catherine Griffiths before I start the presentation. And, um, and she'll say some things towards the end, or you can ask her questions at the end as well. And she's a new um, full-time assistant professor as part of the CDP program as well. So let me begin. And I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Laura Kurgan. I'm the director of the CDP program um, and have been teaching at Columbia for quite a long time. Um, and... I look forward to meeting you all, even if you have questions that you can email. And I'm very glad that there are so many people um, at the open house and especially from so many different parts of the world. So can everybody see and hear? Everything's fine, Adam. Can you? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Good. Yep. Yeah. Great. Um, so if nobody's been to Columbia, this is Avery Hall um, on the Columbia campus where a lot of um, our activities take place. And our program is actually part of the architecture studios. So if you get accepted to, into the program and you come, you will have um, studio likely on the sixth floor of this building, either on the north side or the south side and be mixed in with the architecture students. So just to underscore, our program is in its third year. It's the youngest program at GSAP. Um, and its intent is that it, that it serves as a technical, critical, and creative program that offers you a chance to, you know, learn a lot of techniques, but at the same time to ask questions about the techniques you're learning and also to give you a pathway to transform the kinds of tools that you're using and perhaps inventing to transform the technical environments in which we live. So the tools, just to underscore the tools and data and technology that we deploy are never neutral in the design process. And our program encourages this kind of critical and creative engagement with computational design, both in methods and in practice. And that's a very strong orientation of our program. So we aim for a socially engaged practice in this, what we think of as still an emerging field, especially in the realm of the built environment. And with the full knowledge that in architectural design and planning, computational design has both positive and negative effects on the built environment. So CDP is one of the first programs that connects computational methods to spatial design, analysis, visualization, fabrication, and research through a project-based pedagogy directed at architecture and the built environment across all scales of our practices at GSAP. So you'll notice very quickly when, if you get to come and visit us, um, that we, our students are a mixture of designers and architects who are interested in computation. And on the other hand, a mix of technologists who are interested in design and the built environment. And it's that crossover that we really enjoy um, witnessing in our program. So to describe it in a little more abstract terms, you know, we have these two axes and we use these kinds of two axes a lot in our sort of conceptual design thinking in our program, which starts off with, you know, technology that is sort of technology for technology's sake has less critique and contextualization. And on the other hand, technology, which is, which is used in a much more critical way um, with a full awareness of the biases and politics that are embedded in it. 
And then from right, left to right, we have less technically proficient students entering the program. And on the other hand, we have more technically proficient students. And when you tell stories around those four quadrants, um, what we're trying to encourage is everybody to land in this top right-hand corner where we have an approach of critical computation, activism, creative computation, but not giving up the idea of entrepreneurship altogether. And we want to produce new kinds of entrepreneurs. <clears throat> so the CDP program is both a conceptual curriculum for students to develop a, a technical foundation and, and probably you know, just as important, in fact, maybe more important, a project-based learning curriculum designed for students to develop a critical approach to computation in the context of the built environment, focusing on specific sets of technologies, tools, and concepts. So over here, um, what you see is the a quick curriculum overview, and I'm going to go into each of these pieces in more detail as we move along. But just so you know, there are three colloquium courses. There is a pre-program on the left-hand side of the screen. There are a bunch of foundational classes, and then there are a lot of electives, which you can take um, uh, spanning all across GSAP. Okay. So in terms of the foundation, um, this, as you can see over here, is an online pre-program. And there are three courses that you will be able to take in June if you're accepted into the program. You can do them anywhere in the world, on your own time, doesn't matter when. But there's three different frames for those classes, computational drawing, programming for design practices, and mapping and data. And depending um, on your expertise, we advise you to take, you know, specific modules of that class. Of course, it's fantastic if you take all of them, but we don't require you to take all of them. So there are these three um, basic programs and included in that are a series of tutorials and resources that accompany them, which have you know, our pedagogical approach built into them. So they're not built by a third party organization. These tutorials are built by the teachers who teach these classes. And when you take these classes, they go more in depth and build on what you have done in, in that colloquium, in, in, in those classes. So it's called the Summer Smorgasbord and it's a range of tutorials specifically built for our program. And so you can see over here, if you go to the link, uh, smorgasbord.cdp.arch.columbia.edu, over here, we're looking at some of the mapping classes. Um, over here are the 3D drawing classes. Um, this is an intro to Rhino, and then also to Grasshopper, which is a program language built into a lot of the 3D um, the 3D drawing softwares. Then we also have um, more Python oriented um, tutorials. This is actually not a foundation class, but it's uh, one of the computation electives, which has to do with rendering, Blender. This one is about BIM. And then here we also have a lot about artificial intelligence. So if you scroll through, there are a range of almost 60 tutorials, um, which we then guide you through. So computational drawing is obvious if you've had no experience in 3D modeling or don't even know what an elevation or a plan is, that would be the one that you would definitely focus on. Then we have three approaches to programming. Um, you know, some people have had Python, but they have not had Grasshopper, for example, or some people uh, know web development, but they don't necessarily know Python, which is really we focus on um, in terms of its spatial coding potential. Um, and then there's a segment in mapping and data, which is a basic uh, uh, exploration of QGIS and open source mapping. So then the next thing that we focus on are the colloquium studios. 
And these are unique to our program. And you take the first one, methods as practice, practice as methods in the summer, explore, explain, propose in the fall, and design and action in the spring. And so we like to think of this as a sequence which builds. Um, so methods, the first methods one focuses on what is computation, what are its methods, practices, and politics. We introduce you to a survey of tools and you end up with a series of position sort of probe statements which help you to coordinate the foundation courses which you're doing elsewhere in the summer and you bring it together as a series of uh, questions and provocations. We don't expect you to have an idea for your thesis in that first summer semester unless you enter the program with a very strong idea of what your of what your capstone or thesis might be. In the fall, we guide you through a series of steps um, towards making a proposal, which you then put into action in the spring semester. And over here, um, I actually am teaching this class in the spring along with Snow Area Zhang. And we, um, we guide you through a series of readings and workshops in order to create a project proposal. So we ask questions like, what is computation? What is design? What forms of practice can you imagine emerging with as you leave the program? We think about spatial computation. We think about um, all kinds of ways of using computation in a range of design practices. Um, and then in the spring semester, we ask you to put your design work into action. In some cases, this means to build it. If you have an idea for a website, you build the website. If you are working on a new kind of an algorithm, you show us how it works. If you're building a sensor, you, you actually build it. Um, but, you know, there's a whole range of what putting something into action means, and it can also mean uh, presenting a set of ideas, which you create a debate around as well. So there's a lot of different um, ways of thinking about what the end project of your of your um, of the semester will be, and what a roadmap is towards getting towards implementing it. In some cases, people present uh, pitches, which they can then um, uh, put into action after they graduate, but a lot of people have built their final projects by the time the spring semester comes. So the foundation courses, um, in the end, there's, there's um, seven required classes for the CDP curriculum, uh, which include the colloquium, the three colloquiums, and the four selective uh, required seminars. And then there's a whole series of electives, which, you're, which you can take as well. So now I'm going to talk about those foundation classes. Um, I already described the pre-program, -pro which is part of the smorgasbord. We have these four classes, which is computational modeling. The first three are in the summer semester. So you do computational modeling, which involves advanced parametrics and scripting and custom workflows. And generally we do our work within an urban, some kind of urban environment or some scale of buildable imagination. Um, the second clause is computational design workflows, where over there we're using um, advanced Python, also tool building and custom workflows so that you can integrate work from your other courses together, and then web visualization and a little bit of JavaScript. And the third class is mapping system, where we undertake mapping in Jupyter notebooks. We're handling vector and raster uh, data. We think about geospatial data and Python, mapping and data visualization in Python, and most of the students make interactive web maps by the end of that semester. Then in the fall semester, you build on the computational design workflows class with a course called design intelligence using algorithms in design, statistics, machine learning, um, things like that. 
Then the electives are really far reaching um, across GSAP. And we, Adam and I, help you to coordinate the electives that you choose um, relative to the ideas that you have for your cap capstone project. So all in all, we have 17 computation electives uh, spread across GSAP and about 100 of other electives um, you know, through all the programs. And so our program is, uh, you know, in charge of curating this series of computation seminars. But if you take one of these seminars, you no longer only have CDP students in your classes, you're mixed together with architecture students, urban planning students, real estate students, urban design, historic preservation, um, et cetera. It's a really um, great range of classes where we keep thinking each year about what should disappear and what should get added, uh, you know, depending on what new things uh, have appeared in practice. Um, you know, just recently, we have added um, spatial AI and seeing with algorithms, which is uh, seeing with algorithms is taught by Catherine Griffith. And spatial AI is William Martin. So those are just, you know, two classes that have that we have um, that we've recently added. We also have um, a lot of spatial data narrative classes, a lot of um, uh, classes which involve mapping, some which involve human computer interaction and physical computation, like meta tool and physical computation, et cetera. You can ask us questions about those classes. And so this has become what we call at GSAP um, the computational glue. So it's the methods in computation which bind a lot of scales in the built environment to together through a series of methods. So although your computational design practices students, you get to collaborate and interact with students across GSAP. And that's what this diagram uh, sort of uh, describes where you can see a green box is urban planning, the blue box is architecture and CDP, and you can see how seamlessly it all joins together. Um, so those are the electives. These are the program specific classes across GSAP, which also involve computation. And you can see the workflows related to all of those classes. <clears throat> And then these are the computation workflows in the elective classes. And again, we describe them by the, um, by the method that we're trying to teach and then which program it comes out of and the workflows it involves. And of course, there's a lot of common workflows across all the programs. <clears throat> So then beyond that, um, there are also a lot of other kinds of electives that you can take. Um, there's the representation sequence, there's history theory, there's all kinds of um, classes that you can take even outside of the department and outside of the school. And so here's an example of what you would take as a full-time student, right? You have to take the three foundation classes, you have to take the three colloquiums, and then here's a range of electives that one student might have chosen. Then there's also the part-time option. And if you are a part-time student, what we encourage is that you do the foundation and elective classes first, and then the three colloquiums in the next year with a few leftover um, courses. Um, and that's because you have to take the colloquium in a se sequential way. You can't take them out of sequence. It's just they build in expertise. So I didn't notice that there were any dual degree um, students interested over here, but this is, you, you, there's a joint degree with architecture, there's a joint degree with urban planning, there's a joint degree with the CCP program, which is con Columbia Critical Curatorial Practices. Yeah? Quick question. So yeah. I read online that you couldn't really combine the CDP with an architecture program, can you? Yes. Oh. You yeah, okay. maybe Laura, you can go back yeah. to the slide that had that. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, this one. Yes. So, yeah, so in that case, oh, no, you can go to this Yeah, one. go ahead. Yeah, describe it, Adam. Yeah, so in that case, you know, the Master of Architecture is a three-year program, right? If you were to add CDP to that, and this is the first year we're offering this, so it just got approved, um, it would add a summer and a fall. So here's a, a mock curriculum plan. This could look slightly differently, but in this version, it uh, adds a summer in between your first and second year, where you take all the foundation courses, and then it adds one fall semester at the end to fulfill additional elective requirements. But your third year is really sort of where you finish both like your architecture program, and then you also finish your uh, capstone for CDP. These diagrams, I'm not sure if they're on the GSAP website yet, but if not, they uh, will be very soon um, before the emission cycle is over. Right. So, if, if, Sophia, if you're, yeah, if you're interested in this, then then definitely please email either Adam or I, and we'll send you this diagram. Please, um, if you could just pop your email in the chat, that will be amazing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. Okay. And Benini, you also uh, messaged me separately. Which uh, dual degree are you interested in? Um, the urban planning. Urban planning. Okay. So the, the urban planning you can see over here um, on the right-hand side of the screen. So the yellow is the planning classes and the green are the CDP classes. And you take one summer in your between your first and second year in the urban planning degree and then you end up with um, doing your planning capstone the final capstone in the fall of the third year and you do your cdp capstone in the spring of the second year so you it's again just one extra semester and also cdp has stem um, approval and urban planning doesn't. So that allows you then to work in the U.S. for three years after you've graduated. That's great, thank you. Okay. All right. Um, so over here we have um, a lot of amazing faculty. So I'm a I'm a full time uh, you know CDP professor and. Um, and I also direct um, the Center for Spatial Research and also the Computation Sequence. And Adam Vosberg uh, works with me on both of those things, on the Computation Sequence and on the program. Catherine Griffiths is uh, newly hired and um, will describe a little bit her work after we finish the presentation. David Benjamin, um, is an architecture professor. He runs a practice called The Living. Um, he's really interested in embodied, embodied energy and reducing carbon in the building, in building footprints and materials. He's a very computational thinker. Um, Lola Ben Alon runs the Natural Materials Lab that also uses computational techniques for printing, 3D printing of clay. And Anthony Vanke is a an assistant professor of urban planning, and he teaches a lot of the data analytics um, uh, sequence. And he has his degree from the Department of Urban Planning, uh, his PhD from the Department of Urban Planning at MIT, and did a lot of work in the media lab there. So over here, you see a whole range of adjunct professors who are really deeply invested uh, and have been teaching in the program for all three years already. Uh, Mario Gampieri is at WXY Architecture, so combining urban planning and architecture together, and a whole range of people here. So if you look at the people who teach in the computation sequence and Google them, you'll find the really interesting professional uh, practices that they're involved in from Google Delve to working with artists to um, having their own consultancy practices involving AI and the built environment or web design or you know, thinking beyond the screen what it means to uh, use our computers without all the interfaces that we're so familiar with. Um, we also have a very active um, events um, series. 
we, in the summer semester, we always bring in practitioners who we feel are emerging and are pushing the boundaries of what computational design might, might become in the future. Um, this semester, and in fact, if you're around, um, it's going to be both online and in person. You can register to come in person if you're in New York, but we're doing an AI summit. It's called an Actioning Summit. It's part of the Dean series of um, Actioning Summits where we ask how to X, Y, Z, and we're saying, you know, how does a how is AI having an effect on practices in the built environment? And we've coordinated a series of panels, um, starting with human AI, local AI, spatial AI, urban AI, and it's going to end with a keynote on planetary AI. It promised, promises to be an amazing day, so I really hope that you register uh, from afar. So um, here we go. The CDP summer semester is you do one colloquium, methods as practice, practice as methods, computational modeling, computational design workflows, and mapping systems. Students have come from all over the world. Um, this is our third year and our program grew from 12 to 24 students this past year. We're hoping it'll stay around there, maybe grow a little bit more. Um, the disciplines and practices that people say they've had experience in are very far ranging from interaction design to robotics, to product management, to mapping, to exhibit design. It's such a fabulous um, and diverse array of practices that people come to the program with. Um, so here's some of the work from the past summer. Um, this is um, the, the three seminars, Maria Gampieri's Mapping Systems, Millie Harvey, the Computational Modeling, Celeste um, Computational Workflows, and then last year, Violet, Whitney and William Martin uh, uh, did the summer colloquium. And so then here is the work of just the seminars. And again, these are uh, uh, the two, the top one, the top and the right are current students who you could communicate with right now if you if you have questions for them. Um, and Matthew Heaton was a, is a part-time student um, and he already finished his colloquium sequence. He has maybe a couple more classes to take. So this is what a review looks like in the summer. We have our reviews in Ware Lounge. Um, this was our first year where there was still the traces of COVID. Um, and then in the full semester, um, this is what I'm teaching right now, uh, explore, explain, propose, and then there's design intelligence, and then you take two to three electives. So this was a capstone project of Matthew Heaton, did a beautiful project making a musical instrument, which was guided by places in New York where there was no access to cell towers. So it was kind of about silence and music at the same time, a really beautiful project. Um, this over here is Hong Chin Lee's capstone work where he did machine reading on all the signs in New of, of uh, storefronts in New York City. And by that captured, you know, languages um, across different neighborhoods in New York City, amongst other kinds of diverse array of things. Um, this is clay. This project um, was was about um, medical Medicaid and the uneven distribution of Medicaid across the whole of New York State. And he was looking up at all kinds of vulnerability indexes and disparities in access to, of, if you don't know about healthcare in this country, um, th this is the public, the public healthcare um, for people below a certain income level. 
So here we are at one of our reviews this semester. We try to break the mold of the rest of the architecture school. Instead of having one student present at a time, we have um, small tables where people are presenting their work and testing out their ideas two or three times to an array of faculty. There's Adam and our current uh, current um, students. And this is Snow Area Sang, who co-teaches with me. And then the, this is um, the coding for spatial practices class taught by Celeste Lane. She often asks um, students to archive, to visualize an archive and classify it on a website. And she generally likes, encourages students to use data which has a spatial, spatial orientation. Um, this is Dan Taeyang's class on MetaTool. Um, it's a very, very creative class thinking about space as already coded. And so he starts, starts with a very kind of visceral idea of what code is rather than Python. That's a unique approach. And then the spring semester, this is the design in action class. So this is from last year's students. Um, and just so you know that during the spring semester, you, are, um, you can request travel funding to go somewhere which has some kind of relation to your capstone work. Some people went to conferences like, you know, at SXXW in Austin, Texas. One person was working on an exhibit in Barcelona. One person was doing field work about food distribution in Florida and went to one of the farms, which was in her data set. Um, one person went to ETH in Zurich to look at um, innovations in 3D printing over there. There's a large variety of things that you can do. This over here is a class called Spatial Data Narratives taught by Josh Begley. Um, and so he gets you to visualize um, spatial data and, and make a video. Really, really amazing work comes out of that class. Um, this is the spatial AI class, which was taught for the first time this past um, uh, spring by William Martin and will be taught again, um, looking at all kinds of AI methods and ways that students can uh, use code without, you know, designing it themselves and all kinds of other ways of thinking about AI in relation to the built environment. And if you want to look at the capstone work um, of all the students, the thing about our program is that we really focus on public facing work and public facing scholarship and public facing research. So we require that all our students put their projects um, into, the, into the archive and they're all on the website right now. So you can browse through them to see the range of projects. We always tell students when they're coming, um, you do not need to be constrained by anything that former students have done. And it also doesn't mean you have to not do the same thing as other students either, um, but to build um, on the range of practices implied by computational design, which we think of really as an emerging field and as a field which is changing all the time. So this is um, Hong Chun Lee. I already talked about his project a little bit. Um, this over here is Virginia Zhang's. Um, her, her advisor was Dan Taeyang. She built a lot about on the project that she did in MetaTool and bringing together, which a lot of students are interested in nowadays, bringing together physical and analog um, objects with the digital realm and how to make sort of hybrid uh, combinations of all of those things. And this is Lucia Rebellino. Um, her work was about um, uncertainty um, of weather models. Um, I was her advisor. She did an incredible range of work using um, open source NASA data. And she's currently a finalist for a project at the Venice Biennale. She should hear very soon whether she gets accepted or not, but she was one of 16 uh, students invited to make a proposal. 
Um, this is Zoe Lin's um, project, and she did food networks in Chinatown. I really encourage you to look at her we the, the website related to this. She did incredible work because a lot of it was um, based in data and existing um, mining of Google Street View imagery. So she made her own data set and could see what changed in, in Chinatown over, over a span of years. At the same time, she did field work as well. And her project was very much a kind of narrative, spatial data, you know, journalism um, type of thing. Uh, she ended up getting interviewed by somebody in the Washington Post who saw her project. So this is what we've done so far, you know, out of the 25 uh, alumni, 22 replied to our survey, 100% of the students in the first year cohort are fully employed at this time. 80% of the recent graduates um, have jobs by now, and they're, you know, some of them have internships, so they're still looking. Um, They've done a really great array of things. There's some of the employers on the left-hand side, some of their job titles on the right-hand side. So you can see the range of things that come out of our program, which I think is, is really unique about what we do. Um, I've already told you a few of the awards and accolades that our students have received. In, and remember, we're only in our third year. And just to reiterate, you know, our program is for you if you're interested in activism, in algorithms and social justice, in creative technology. I should add critical computation now that um, Catherine has entered our faculty, data visualization, design justice, digital public infrastructure, entrepreneurship, all of these things. Um, and of course, anything that you might want to add to this list. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing the screen and take an array of questions. And also, Catherine, if you want to add anything based on your own research, um, please do. Uh, yeah, I could jump in. Hi, mm -hmm. I'm Catherine Griffiths. I just joined um, the CDB program this fall. So I'm teaching my first course right now, um, Seeing with Algorithms. Um, I, my work is um, at the intersection of critical AI studies and design. Um, so I'm interested in um, what sometimes I call controversial algorithms um, or, you know, algorithms that are sort of at the intersection of some kind of struggle or conflict. Um, so um, by that, it could be like software, new software that's being prototyped and set tested out in in more socially sensitive places you know maybe places that haven't encountered these new uh, AI methods that we're starting to see so it's kind of shifting things in ways that were um <clears throat> sometimes there's unexpected uh, so it could be things like the way that AI tech is being tested out by police forces um to say manage crowds in urban environments like protest groups or um, it could be the way that AI is being apply, applied to how like local governments um, assign social housing um, and benefits and things. Um, and so within that, my work is trying to use design to kind of visualize like not just the technology and its procedures, but sort of layering in these socio-technical um, and socio-political like implications and ent entanglements. Um, yeah, and I'm I'm also specifically interested in in like labor politics and workplaces and the kind of role of the future of work with under kind of this AI management. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Catherine. Um, so we we'd love to open it up to questions. Who would like to ask the first question? Okay, I can see something here. Oh, okay. Um, how is MSCDP different from MSAAD? In addition, additionally, what future electives are you thinking of proposing? Um, well, we've just added um, three new electives. I'll ask, answer that directly. We have a, a, a course that Catherine is teaching on 
climate activism, and we have a new class on physical computation, which will be offered this spring by Daniel Lessinger. Um, and we introduced the spatial AI. So that's uh, I, that's very recent. I can't tell you what we're going to do next year. It's very different from the MSAAD. You come into the MSAAD program and you do um, an architecture studio. You choose from one of you know twelve studios in the summer, and you're only with your own cohort in the summer, and you take a class on, you know, I don't know. I think it's about, I think it's called transcolarity right now. Um, and then in the spring semester, in, in the fall and the spring semester, you just join the lottery of the advanced architecture studios. So you're doing architecture studios, which are nine credit classes, and then you take two electives. You don't do a colloquium, you don't do a capstone, any of those things. So um, that's the difference. Um, then over here, I'm from a non arch background, but I'm really interested in UX. I'm interested in seeing them as well. Yeah, you know, um, some people have taken the intro to architecture program before they've um, come to the school, but um, the, the smorgasbord is really designed to fill that gap. So I think the intro to architecture and our intensive um, summer semester are coincident so i don't think is that correct adam i don't think yeah. you can do them together yeah um yeah but you can't do them together that being yeah, yeah we if you want to talk david if you want to speak to someone who's in our program from a non-design background this person yeah. was um, like an engineering and uh, data analysis backgrounds they did intro to architecture and then they joined our program the next year i'm happy to connect you with them but yeah. I mean, on the previous slides, you might have seen um, the people who come into this program have really wide backgrounds, probably 10, 15 percent have humanities, another like 10 percent like social sciences, mm -hmm. no design at, at all. And um, the smorgasbord is really designed to sort of get everyone up that. to like a similar level. Right. If um, you, you, yeah. There were two two students. Neil Potness had a UX UI uh, design degree from U Austin. And so if you yep. look at his thesis, you can see what he did by the end of the semester. Zoe Lin also came in with no design background at all. And she was the one who did the, the Chinatown food project. Yeah. Um, architecture and CDP. Well, I mean, if you're doing a dual architecture and uh, program with CDP, you will be getting, you know, the same education. A lot of architecture, the MRH students come in with no background at all. So you will be like any of them. But if you do CDP, you also, you know, will be able to interview in offices with the range of uh, very specific skills you learn uh, through our program as well. And you'll have yeah. the benefit of having a thesis like project. So I think you'll, you'll probably be one of the students, you know, oftentimes in the architecture program, people specialize in one track or another that's presented to them by the architecture program. You know, there's one like design tech and design and engineering or, materials and architecture or, you know, more sort of performance and architecture, more sort of installation, artistic kinds of practices. Um, and whereas with us, you know, you will have a, an expertise in computational design and whatever you define that to be, we help you define that. Um, okay. But, I'll, but Claire, also to answer the part of your question about would you recommend the dual if I don't have a design degree? Uh -huh. um, no. I, yeah, I don't necessarily think so. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've had people come in that don't have design backgrounds in any way, shape, or form, and now they're working as like design researchers or as you know something similar to that in like a vaguely design field. I do not think this program, if you do not have an architecture background, will prepare you to become an architect. Like yes, that I would definitely say. But if right. you were to do the dual it would prepare you very well to be an architecture technologist, a creative technologist at an architecture firm. 
but it's definitely if you want to work in design afterwards this program itself could prepare you for yeah. that as well right if you want to become a licensed architect this is not the program for you our program is based in the fact that architecture students go off into the world and do so many things related to topics in the built environment that they don't necessarily need to learn structural engineering or architectural code, you know, and what it yep. means to be a licensed architect. That's the unique part of our program. You're in a, an architecture school with exposure to a lot of those uh, fields and specializations, um, but you are being trained to enter a lot of different kinds of professions, not just go into an architecture office. Okay. Any other questions? I have a question. I'm on the train, so I apologize if it's super loud. That's um, okay. I'm wondering if there's been like joint capstones or group capstones and sort of along that similar vein of thought, like are there collaborations with people or researchers outside of this department? Yeah. This is something sort we would like love biology or something like right, that. Right, right. This is something we would love to encourage in the future. And we are in the process. It's not something I emphasized and Adam can talk to this as well. We're in the process of trying to create partnerships with either practices outside of Columbia, but it also could be with sensors within Columbia. So there is an incredible biology, computational biology department at Columbia, and there's also the neuroscience, you know, the mind brain to behave, mind brain to behavior institute. So there are a lot of those kinds of things, but you would probably need to come in with that idea to begin with. And as you're applying, we could help you, you know, sort of make uh, contact with some people, you know, but it would be hard to discover that very easily in a three semester in a three semester program but we have had people do um, work with the brown institute the brown institute for media innovation two people found their way there participated in hackathons entered their grant cycle and have you know continued um, in terms of publishing papers and things like that um, with them we also have had people uh, engage with the entrepreneurship. What's it called? The entrepreneurship program. Entrepreneurship at Columbia. Yeah. yeah. Entrepreneurship. Columbia Startup Lab. Yeah. Right. Um, and have gotten some really great help and suggestions, you know, things like that. What else? Neil was working yeah. with a teacher's college a bit right. formally, and now he's yes. pursuing a PhD there. Um, right. That's yeah. right. And he that he established that while he was here and then applied for a PhD. Yep. He first went and worked for a year in another research yep. um, center and then applied for a PhD. And he's now at Teachers College doing a PhD. Yeah. Yeah. And Manini, just so you know, um, like, say, for example, you were apply and you had like an interest in computational biology or some background in it. Um, your capstone project, you're allowed to have an advisor and that person that advisor can be someone outside of gsat too we just mm -hmm. have to kind of know about it ahead of time so we can make sure that we can appoint them but we definitely kind of try to leave space for external input on a project whatever external might mean for your case yeah um, that's super exciting thank you so much i'd love to speak um if you want to hear about that deeper okay that's I great. a question about um sorry is it common for students in this program to also pursue research on the side? Like I know Lola has like her 3D printing stuff that she's doing. Yes, is that yes. Like common? Yeah, our students, there's a, 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 you know, the applications for TA ships and research positions yep. goes out to the whole school and our students, you know, they, they're they competitive um, with sure. many of the students who apply for them. Um, yep. Someone over here is asking about the design portfolio. Yes, you should definitely um, include things that are not suited for visual representation. Um, you know, like if you have some code or something that you're very proud of, you should put it, you know, because we really are trying to get students from uh, different disciplines. So, you know, we like to see something in your portfolio that shows you have a visual ability, um, but you know, there's so many different kinds of 
projects that you can end up doing that might not be visual. And then you should say that in the portfolio that you're interested in continuing your you you know your software or engineering expertise, but you want to focus specifically on the built environment. That's the key, right? So it's not so much the visual, but it's that your work is related to the built environment at any scale. Does that help? Who's that? P. Madsen. I don't know who that is. Yeah, Laura. Maybe I could yeah. ask a question. That yeah. I'm also just bouncing off that last one. So what would, you, what would you recommend for someone that maybe doesn't have the design background to include or how do they sort of um, outline their interests in the application in a portfolio? Like say someone that had a sociology background or a political science background or um, they like they didn't have the design part. Right. They Some people have, you know, put the obvious thing is people put hand drawings, you know, but they don't have to do that. You can put a piece of a, you know, the relevant part of a paper, or you can put um, some photography, you know, there's so many, there's so many, you know, if you do field work, you know, what were, what were some of the questions you have to show that the interest is in the built environment. So any, any evidence of any of your other work that shows how you've approached the built environment that goes into the portfolio. I think I would also maybe add to that quickly, just like whatever kind of background you have or medium you work in, whether it be design or whether it be technical, like some demonstration of kind of critical and creative thinking, I think is just really valuable too. I'm remembering one applicant that had like a kind of a comp sci background and they had no design expertise and they, like showed this really like fun computation project, which was a take on like the paperclip problem um, without to describe it because I don't want to like give anyone's, anyone's personal mm -hmm. information away. But um, it was just like, it was a way to see that even though they had like worked a lot of very like technical scientific jobs, they actually also had like a really great like sort of critical lens and idea of how to apply those tools creatively. Yeah. Um, there's a very important question here. Someone asked for dual degree pro programs, do I need to submit separate applications? Absolutely, yes. You have to be accepted by both programs to be a dual degree program. Uh, okay, a dual degree citizen, uh, citizen, a dual degree uh, um, applicant. Um, the Minimum the, TOEFL? Minimum TOEFL. I think it's a hundred, um, but yeah. it's on the GSAP website. You should double yeah. check me. Right. And then also uh, I don't have access to the admitted student stats. I don't know. That's a question for admissions. Yeah. Um, Sophia. Hi. Um, Hi. I was wondering if there were any type of scholarships regarding like specific for the program or any type. Yeah, there's, yeah, there is, right, there is financial aid, it's merit based, and you, you know, you just have to um, say you're interested in it as part of the application. Okay. Yeah. But there's some um, external funding sources as well. There's a few kind of other things available. I just put a link in the chat. Um, admissions is hosting a session tomorrow about admission specific and financial aid specific questions. That might be more helpful than us. Yeah. Okay, we have a few more minutes. Anybody, any last questions? Yeah, Can I see me? one here. Yeah. Um, so this is more about the resources and school. Mm -hmm. Are there tools and shop spaces available for the program that might assist hands-on study when you want to make your computational studies into a physical demonstration? Totally. Yeah. You want to answer yeah, that, a, Adam? Yeah. Yeah, we, we have um, yeah, we have a makerspace, um, similar to what many architecture schools would have. It's a large, full wood shop, couple CNCs, plasma cutter, metal lab, bunch of three D printers, laser cutters, um, robot material, arm. new robot arm. This yeah. is CDP <laughs> students got yeah. working this semester. Yeah. Um, there is plans for a bigger robot arm. I'm not sure if that'll be available by mm. next year. Yeah. Um, that's on the way. And then also I maintain like a library of electronics that CDP students are free to borrow. So things like Arduinos, Raspberry Pi, 
Um, and then the soldering irons and all that kind of equipment is down in the makerspace. And are those uh, sort of shared throughout the departments? Yes. Yes. The electronics that I have, uh, CDP students and people in computation electives, it's kind of for them. Um, but yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I think that's just about, oh, can professional letters of recommendation be from a person who is not an architect? Yes. Okay, but just yes, the answer is yes. Um, is the part-time program less common? Um, the part-time program is less common and um, and also you're not eligible for TA ships or any scholarships if you're a part-time student. Um, however, the part-time program allows you to go at a slower pace and um, those students have really enjoyed doing it um, in relation to full-time jobs and it also, yeah. yeah. Yeah, just well, uh, I, I should also add on it real quick. So far, we've, we've been able to make it work, but mm -hmm. part-time students are also not guaranteed studio space. So full-time students, they have desks and studio space, part-time students. We've been able to make it work so far, but we can't but, promise that yeah. we'll continue to. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. You will have access to all the software and in a, yeah. Well, part-time students won't have access to a studio computer, which is right. where most of the software comes. So sometimes there are cases in which part-time students have to get their own software. Right. So you have we have yeah. desks which are allocated to part-time students on a rotating basis so that they have equal access to all the software, but you can't virtually uh, uh, log into software as a part-time student. You have to come to the studio with a shared desk. That hasn't been the case up until now, but we don't know. It depends. What happens? How many students are there year to year? It's our building is not expandable, sadly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks so much. And thanks for coming. And we hope, you know, if you have any questions, then feel free to email us.